you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask you to turn to the book of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Uh, while you're turning there, remember always to pray for our missionaries, and uh, uh, the Lord has blessed us financially, and uh, we need to be mindful that we're down one missionary. Uh, Brother Downs went home to be with the Lord, and at least in my numbers, that gives us $125 to use on something else. And so, uh, if you know somebody good and has a, that are in a good work, church would love to hear about it. Second uh, Timothy chapter two, beginning in verse fourteen. Second Timothy chapter two, verse fourteen. The Bible says, "Of these things, put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting." of the hearers. Study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness, and their, er and their word will eat as doeth a canker, of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred, saying the resurrection is past already, and overthrew the faith of some. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his. And let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and vessels of silver, but also of wood and earth, some to honor and some to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel of honor, sanctified, meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Dear Lord, we praise you and thank you for another opportunity that you've given us to be before your people this morning and we pray that we would never take it lightly. God help your churches about the land today. In the day which we live, if Satan would get the upper hand, it would be discouraging. God, we pray tonight, this morning, that you would meet with us as a people together. Uh, save the lost that are here with us, Lord. What a, a stirring a great victory that would be and we know that you're still capable of salvation. You're uh, still capable of manifesting yourself. And we pray that you would do that to the lost this morning. Meet with us, not, Lord, not because we're worthy, but because we need it. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'll be preaching this morning on the thought, feeling fit as a fiddle. Now, a lot of times people today, if you ask them, What's you know how are they doing? You're gonna you might as well you know you met those people if you ask them how they're doing you might as well sit down because it's gonna be a while and you may be pass them in the grocery and you almost avoid them because you don't want to hear about it uh, and you know what some of that is genuine you know that there are a lot of six people out there today but I say this there's a lot more that are spiritually sick and many don't know it. And there is a price to getting spiritually fit, and many of us do not want to take what it gets to be spiritually fit. Uh, uh, Donna and I was talking the other day, and I've been putting on weight, and uh, Donna says, well, let me know when you want me to help you. And it struck with me, I have to be ready. It has to be my determination. It has to be, and that is true with every individual. And you know, I get so sick of people grumbling about their lives. This, you know, I, my daddy treated me this way. You know what? Move on. It's a brand new day. Continue on. And you'll never be of any use to Christ till you get fit. Yeah. To get to a condition wherein that you can be used of the Lord, and that was Paul's advice to young Timothy and to the churches. The church in Ephesus is the one that Timothy pastored, and he was passing along to them, you need to be in a condition that you can be used of the Lord. And so going back to verse 14, the Bible says, of these things, of the things I'm listing you, 
of the things I'm writing down, you put the church, that's what it says, of these things, excuse me, of these things, put them in remembrance. In other words, they, to remember something, you've had to know it some other time in your life. And you know what? I think as the Lord's people today, a lot of us are forgetting how to serve Him. Uh, forgetting how to, how to yield ourselves to the Master's use. Forgetting what is a, an encouraging life to God. You know what? A lot of times today, people are not so much discouraged with church if you get Get it, scrape it all away, what they really are is discouraged with their self. Yeah, yeah. They're discouraged with their self. And, and so we find then that as Paul, and, and excuse me, as Paul is writing to Timothy, he says, take this and do this with your congregation. Of these, put them in remembrance, uh, charging them before the Lord. Now that's a serious thing when you do that. If, if any of you ever uh, have seen a ordination, there's usually a man of God that will preach the charge to that individual. And what a charge does is makes you accountable. Yeah. You know what? We live in a day and age where nobody's accountable for anything. It's always someone else's fault. If you notice that, especially among young people, you know, well, it was this and that and another. No. You know what? If I go into a liquor store and buy some liquor and get drunk, you know who's, who's in, involved with that? Me. It ain't mama's fault. It ain't daddy's fault. It ain't Donna's fault. I take on responsibility of that. And that's our problem today is no one is accountable for anything. And so we find then that as Paul is writing to the to uh, Timothy, he says, you tell them about it, and then you make them accountable. You give them a charge. You, you, you remind them that this now is an obligation, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit. Now, I've seen that a lot of times, and you know, uh, it, uh, uh, it gets me when men get together, and you know, uh, sometimes just throw out a question that's so foolish. Now, uh, did, did Adam have a belly button? Man, that's spiritual, ain't it? You know, it's foolish. That is just as foolish as it can be. You know what? It doesn't matter if he had one or if he didn't. He was the first man made in the image of the Almighty God. That's all I need to know. And more than that, God gave him life. The Bible says that he breathed into his nostrils and he became a living soul, the only creation that it ever says about. Those are the type of things that... The, so we find then, if we get into that, and man, God's people today, they're, you know, when did the church start, and, and blah, 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 blah. And when we find here, it says, be very careful about those things. He says, because it leads to strife. And they strive about words to no profit, but to the subverting or the discouragement or the putting down of the hearers. And so this morning, the hearers are you. And so I find it my charge not to put things down, not to discourage people. You go to some conferences, and man, you're in worse shape than when you got there. And the reason why is because people are putting individuals down. And that's, he says, Timothy, you be careful about that. Then he says, study to show thyself approved unto God. A workman needeth not to be ashamed. In other words, you know, when you get down building something, you don't need to be ashamed of it. You don't need to be embarrassed to say, you know what, I put that together. And so the workman, the preacher of God, needs to know that word so when he's done, he's not embarrassed by what he preached. And so we find then that Paul also reminds young Timothy, you be prepared when you get out there before him. Verse 16. But shun profane and vain babbling. Now, my personal opinion on this is nothing more than people pumping themselves up and the so-called speaking in tongues of the holiness people. And I, I, I take no reservation uh, of saying that because I believe it was already mixing into the church by this point. And he says, you shun that, stay away from it. Now, I want you to, to see that it says shun, but it did not say criticize. It did not tell them to shut up. He said, just stay away from it. 
Shana. Don't, you don't need to be involved. Uh, but shun profane and vain babblings, they will increase unto more ungodliness. And there, now notice it says there, that is a possessive um, meaning uh, ownership. And their word shall eat as doeth a canker or cancer. Now, if cancer is not addressed, it will consume the body. Now, uh, so we find then, if things in the church come up and it's not addressed, it'll, it'll eat like a canker. It, it, it will bring you down. Now, similarly, and we're dealing mostly with individuals today, if you have a spiritual issue and it is not addressed, it's going to eat you alive. You know what? We all need to know the spiritual issues in our life, do we not? We need to know what encourages us, and we need to know what discourages us. We need to know what the Bible says, and we need to have a willingness to be submitted, submissive on unto the Bible. And so we find then, he says, you be careful about this, because it's going to eat you up. It's going, to, it's going to become a great deal of problem to you. And I, I would say today that's... Uh, that's a lot of what goes in the churches is that they're eaten up. Uh, then he gives an example of whom is Hymenaeus and Philetus, who concerning the truth have erred. Now apparently Hymenaeus and Philetus were on the ball. They were doing what God told them to. They were embracing the truth. And the Bible didn't say that Satan came down and possessed them. It didn't say that they hated, that he, they started hating Paul. All it says is that they erred. You know what? That's pretty scary. Is that, that, that that's all their problem was, was an error. One little thing. And that's why I say it can eat like a canker. If you, don't, if you don't align yourself with the Word of God, it can mess you up. So Philetus and Hymenaeus, this is exactly what happened to them. It ate them up. Verse 18, who concerning the truth, the truth is always singular, who concerning the truth have erred, and their problem was saying that the resurrection is past already, and, over, and have overthrown the faith of some. Now that is a doctrine that is still out there. There are some groups, supposedly Christian, that believe the resurrection happened in about the 70th year, and now we go, there'll, there'll be no great resurrection. In other words, we go on to be with the Lord, which I agree with that part, but the graves have already burst open previously. There are people actually believe that. And, and, and so he says that group, that, that they've erred from the faith. That they have walked away from the truth. In other words, they're no longer fit. They're no longer useful. They're no longer helpful to the cause, the cause of Christ. Because they embrace this. You know, shunning profane and vain babblings, if you don't, it's like eating the wrong thing. You know what, if we eat enough poison to kill us, we, we was talking about work the other day, there's a couple of us there, and I, I thought everybody had heard, heard this, and I said, man, she runs around here like a rat on decon. And one of my friends started laughing, she goes, I have never heard of that in my life. And I said, well, you've messed up. Uh, uh, but, you know, rats eating the wrong thing is what puts them in that condition. Right. Yeah. And the very same thing with us, us spiritually eating the wrong thing uh, puts us in a condition where we're vulnerable to stuff, stuff like this. Verse 19, nevertheless, despite what other people do, despite what other people is going on, despite what even other of the Lord's churches is doing, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal. Now, I want you to see, we live in a discouraging day. You see church after church, flip-flopping man after man, doing things that the Bible is very specific on. He said, forget about it. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. You know what? I may be the one they're talking about next, letting people down and being a discouragement to God's people and instead of an encouragement to them. Don't depend on me, but listen, you can depend on God. 
The foundation of God is sure, just as hard as limestone rock. It's not going to fail. But mankind will. And, you know, a lot of, a lot of times the, uh, one of the things we're not fit as a fiddle is we've been looking a long time to other things and comparing ourselves to them. Uh, don't compare numbers. Don't compare spirituality. What, how are we aligning with this book? That, that's where your comparison is. The Lord knoweth them that are His. What a wonderful, wonderful blessing. When you lay down tonight, the Lord knoweth you. He knows exactly who you're at. He knows the burdens on your heart. He knows the Ill illness in your body. He knoweth those that are His. The Lord knoweth them that are His. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. Now, you don't get that first part. You get, whoo! But then, the command, if we really know Christ, let's depart from iniquity. Let's don't be like the rest of the world. Let's don't act like the rest of the world. Let's don't present like the rest of the world. Let's get, let's get iniquity out of our lives, out of our homes, and out of our churches. If we want to have some, to be fit of Fit as fiddle, some health needs have to be addressed. See what I'm saying? You can't ignore cancer or it'll take you out. Right? You can't ignore diabetes or you're going to die. Right? You have to address the problem. And we live in a day and age today where the problem is this, is people are ignoring the problem and then they're not fit for the master's use. Verse 21, if any, there, if any man therefore purge himself to the, from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Yeah. Now, I want, to, I want to notice a couple of things. First of all, uh, Baptists don't like if statements, but he says if you purge. You know what fasting is about? And fasting is still a good Bible doctrine in the modern day. Fasting is about this, denying this filthy, ungodly flesh. Yeah. That's what fasting is all about. And so he, uh, he recommends that we, uh, that we uh, address, that we uh, take note, that, that we uh, purge. A uh, purging of the body is often denying itself. Deny yourself of food. You know, another good purge is drinking lots and lots of water. I'm not a big water fan. I have to, I have to kind of psych myself up for it. But that's a type of purging. And we have to purge ourselves spiritually. And the way to do that is ask yourself, why do you do something? Why do I preach the gospel for 25 years? Am I doing it for the right reason? Am I doing it to be seen or to be heard or out of expectation? Or am I really still doing it just to spread the glorious good news? And see, it takes a purging occasionally like, yes, yes, I've got that other stuff aside and I'm preaching it that others might know Christ like I do. And that is, that's what he's talking about. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor. No, maybe. That you will be brightening. That you will be honoring. You will be lifting up unto Christ. Sanctified. Set apart. Now, uh, Donna, don't mess with Donna's kitchen. And uh, she's took me in there and through the cabinet's door open and said, why is this here? And I'm like, well, I put it there. And where does it go? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> and then she'll show me where it goes, and I'll take and I'll, I'll move it over. See, she set that aside for a purpose. And it has a specific purpose to accomplish. And it has to be available. See, you know what the problem is today with the Lord's people? They're not available. They're, they're not cleaned up, and they're not in the right spot for the work to be done. And, and, and so a lot of times, once 
We purged ourselves. We just have to sit and wait. You know, a lot of times we're like, well, I've done this and, and I'm all prepared. I'm ready to go. And then because the Lord isn't immediately at our beck and call, oh well. You know, sometimes it's just you just have to wait. Yeah. You have to be patient. He might, he might not jump just because you say frog, sanctified and meet or ready for the master's use and prepared unto every good work. In other words, you can't exclude some. Say, well, I'll do this for the Lord, but I'm not going to do this. I'm gonna, I'll go this far, but I won't go way far. In other words, every good work, whatever the availability is, whatever the process is, I will do it. Flee, uh, flee also youth, youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, and charity. Peace. Charity, peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. So I ask you this morning, are you useful unto the Lord? Now, everybody immediately jumps to redemption or salvation. Yeah, I'm saved. And even when I ask you, I ask you this, are you meek for the master's use? And go with me to Isaiah chapter 6. Are you ready? For the work that the Lord has given his people to do. Isaiah chapter 6, very familiar verses of scripture, but we're going to read them again in your hearing. Now, Isaiah was a prophet, a preaching man in his day, that time and time and time again called out against Israel and against their sin and against their idolatry. He was faithful to what the Lord told him to do. Now you can read uh, you can read one through five and you won't find Isaiah being ungodly. You won't find Isaiah being mean. In fact, you'll find Isaiah preaching the word of God. But I really think this was his problem to chapter six. He lacked compassion. He lacked compassion. You know, we live in a day and age where I wonder sometimes why people, why people are preaching to start with. If you're not motivated to serve Christ by your love for lost people, then why are we serving Him? Why, why do we continue to preach? Why do we can't continue to do the things we do? And so we find Isaiah has this experience in the temple. In the first verse, the Bible says of chapter 6, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord standing upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Now, I want you to see that it was a very specific time for Isaiah when this happened. He, he wrote it down and he had a memory of it. It was the year that Uzziah died that I had this experience with the Almighty. Now, uh, again, I want to point out to you that Isaiah is already saved in, in, in an Old Testament sense. Redemption had not been offered, but, but he was a follower unto God. He was one that loved God. He's the one that, he was one that cherished God and would cry out against the sin of Israel. A saved man having this experience. You know what that tells me? That when we get right, righteous and haughty, we need to experience God again. We, we need to experience humility again. You know, remember, uh, he saved you, not the other way around. Yeah. And, and you, you, you lay in a hopeless condition too before the Lord saved you. And so he says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. You know what? What we need sometimes is just to see God's holiness and see his righteousness and remember how filthy we really are. See, that was very moving for, for Isaiah when he saw himself in, in the limelight of God. And it will be for you too. See, all that Baptist self-righteousness will, will fluid right away. 
and, and you won't be so concerned about the five points as you, as you are that others might know Christ. And, and, and so we see then that Uzziah in the very, excuse me, that Isaiah in the very same way saw Christ anew. Above it, meaning uh, the throne, above it stood the seraphims or the, or the uh, angels. Each had six wings and with twain he covered his face and with twain he covered his feet and with twain he did fly. And I, I'll point out to you that six wings opposed to the two-winged one that you'll see in Catholic churches. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, and the whole earth is filled with his glory. You know what? Uh, one way to recognize and know if you want to be humble, Dan, you look out there today, it's so beautiful and warm, and it stayed this about a week, the grass would start getting green, and we'd see the little buttercups start to show their self, and what a beautiful, you know, that's the Lord's glory. Look on the beauty about you. You see the harmlessness of a newborn child and how sweet and precious that, that, that's part of the Lord's glory. See, it's an amazing thing. And can you imagine Isaiah saw him up in the temple and, and it totally changed him. You know what? If you can see God this morning, it will totally change you. And I'm talking to the redeemed. And, and, and so we find then, as the Lord's people, a lot of times our problem is this. We have our mind on something else. And I believe that Isaiah did too. Then, uh, then said I, woe is me. How many people can say that this morning? Now again, it's a preacher. A preacher already, already starting his work to deliver God's word to the nation Jerusalem. And he says, woe is me. You know, if you would follow the things of God this morning, that would be your answer to His holiness is woe is me. I, I, I'm in a mess. I need some help. Woe is me. Now, why don't we see that today amongst God's people? And I used to think it was self-pride. But I really believe I've come to the conclusion it's not self-pride because when we get in front of God, our pride will leave. We don't have to shoot it away. So then my conclusion is this. We just don't see God. Amen. Don't think I'm going to, right? And, and instead of just playing church, in other words, we need to have church. Instead of going through the motion, mm -hmm. we need God to meet with us. Amen. And I also interject this. Apparently Isaiah didn't ask for this experience, but God brought it to him rather. But it ought to be the hungering of our, of, our, of our souls that we might meet unto God just like he did. So the result was this, that Isaiah, a preaching man, a man of God, then said, I, woe is me, I am undone. <laughs> now, a couple of things I'm undone that I've come to, and, and I think this is the one, uh, <clears throat> Donna fixed me some brownies the other night, and they were good and gooey in the middle, but that middle was almost undone. You see what I'm saying? And sometimes we're just not done yet. I'm undone. In other words, I'm not ready for the work. I thought I was ready for the work, but I'm undone. I haven't made my preparation. I hadn't prayed enough. I haven't fasted enough. I haven't gone before the Lord enough. I'm not done. What about you this morning? See, are you undone? Are you ready for the or are you ready for the master's work? See, if you're not done, then you're not fit for the master's use. And then said I, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. That's an indication that you're undone. That, that, that's something that shows you're not ready. Now, I don't believe he was a blasphemer. I don't believe Isaiah was a cusser. I don't believe he went out and swore around places. I believe his undone lips was like this. I'm better than you. 
I'm in the will of God. And Israel, let me tell you how ungodly you are. That's why God sent me. No, most certainly it wasn't. The reason he sent me was to offer and point to something that's, that has a redeeming power. That, that, that's, that, that, that's, he, and, and I, I love good doctrine, but he didn't, he didn't send me to preach Baptist doctrine. He preached me, he sent me to preach the hope of humanity. And that is the person of Jesus Christ. So his unclean lips was the filth of this world. He wasn't preaching the right things. And he wasn't preaching in the right spirit of compassion. He notices this. And I dwell in the midst or the middle of a people of unclean lips. Now remember, he was a preacher, if you want to call him that, at that time. And he was in the midst of the temple. He was in the center of religion. And he decided, hey... They have no more compassion than me. They're not saying anything more in a godly sense than I am saying it. They don't have gun lips. They don't have clean lips any more than I. Then he says, For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Now that is the necessary thing if you want to be used of the Lord this morning is you have to see the Lord in His holiness, in His sinlessness, in His glory. You say, well, I can't see that. Yes, you can. You pray and you look into that Word in faith, you can see Him in His glory. You can see how holy He is. You can see how capable and powerful He is. Yeah. Uh, me and Jared and Adam was looking at a little missionary note back there, so we, we looked up the site, and they, it is about accepting Jesus. That, that was their plan of salvation. See, there's no, there's, no, there's no deity in that, is there? None whatsoever. It, it don't put you as a beggar. Put, it puts you on, well, when I get ready, I'm going to do it, and I ain't going to do it until they get ready. Right? And, and so we find that a lot of times the reason that, that we're no more useful in fit than we are is we don't see God as He is. Yeah. Verse 6, Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongs of the altar, and he laid it on my mouth and said, Lo, this is touch thy lips, thine iniquity is taken away, thy sin is purged. And so this event that the angel did, they came by and touched him, and I want you to see it made contact with him. He had that holy, he had that holy coal about him in the tongues, and he crammed it in his mouth. And, and uh, you know what? That would burn like fire. So that tells me this, getting rid of sin and self-pride is painful. Yeah. You know, it, it hurts going and coming. And, and, and sometimes what we need to do uh, is say, you know what? <laughs> Remember this, you're a helpless sinner. Remember this, these others out here, they're in the same, you know, well, I really admire him. And then you might even, you might even see Somebody lets you down, hurts your feelings. You know why? Because they're built of the same stuff you are. Yeah. And, and they're not abiding in holiness. They're not abiding in usefulness. So don't get too down on people. Otherwise, pray for them. And pray that the Lord might do something to them like Isaiah experienced. Verse 8. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, who shall I send and who will go for us? Now, if you, if you underline in your Bible, notice the triune God. He said, who will go for us, not for me? Who will go for us? Who will go for Jesus? Who will go for the Holy Ghost? Who will go for God Almighty? Who will go? <laughs> also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, here I am, send me. 
you know, that's when he made it right. That's when he was ready to go. The rest of the book is written totally different than the first five chapters. And you know why? Because he'd gotten close again unto God. Now he was fit for the master's use. See me, see me. You know, he grumbled about it before. Kind of like Jonah got an assignment from God and ran in the wrong direction. You know, uh, Jonah wasn't the first fellow that did that. <laughs> but when you're in the right mind of God, you're ready to go. You're useful. You're meat for the master's use. He said, send me. I I'd love to go. And he certainly did. And he was very faithful. Very faithful to the word of God, even to the undoing of himself. Now, I want to read a couple of places and then we we'll close. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4. And just to show you that this is not just a lost, saved experience. Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, in the first verse. The Bible says this, Then was Jesus led of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, I want you to see the deliberateness of God and putting Jesus in a very precarious situation. And so sometimes he's been very deliberate in our own lives to make us have an experience like under Isaiah. It may be through your children or grandchildren. But, but see, that would set everything else aside and leave you and God alone. You remember when uh, uh, Mo, uh, Isaiah, I mean, excuse me, um, they were, uh, names left me. He was fleeing his father in law, Laban, Israel. And he was running from him. And he had that experience where he met the angel and wrestled with him all night. You remember that? He said, I won't turn you loose until I get a blessing. And it was such a scourge, it impacted, it impacted his flesh. You know, you know what it says concerning that? He walks with a limp ever since, at, at, uh, the rest of his life after that. And he put his hand right here, throw his hip out of joint. He walked like this. Have you ever seen anybody with a hip with a joint out? That's how they walk. They throw the leg instead of walking with it. Mm. And he, he went that way the rest of his life. But you know what? It was worth it to him. Yeah. He got something from God. See, usually every time you have an experience of closeness, it's going to impact your flesh. It's going to make you change just a little bit. And hey, that's okay. And so the Lord God very deliberately put the Lord Jesus Christ in a very precarious situation. And God will do that way to us too at times. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward a hunger. Now, you know that the devil verged on him, but I, I want you to say to show this. You don't have to be lost because it was impossibility for Christ to be lost because he was a deity. You don't have to be lost for the devil to threaten you. And a lot of times we're not ready for that. Why? Because we're not spiritually fit. You know, we live in a fitness age now. Everybody's just obsessed with their own bodies. You know, uh, nothing wrong with that. I like people to be healthy. But wrong got into that problem, and it was under the destruction of their own nation. You know, I think everybody, a little, you know, temperance. Bible says this, body, body, bodily exercise profiteth little. Don't say don't profit of anything, but you can't make it an obsession. And, and, and so we find then, uh, we find then as the Lord's people that we, uh, we can be attacked just as easily, our vessel disabled, our, fitness, our spiritual fitness be gone, and then we're not useful anymore. We're, we're not ready as we once were. Now I want to go to... Uh, Acts chapter 9. Very familiar verses of scripture as well. The salvation of Paul on his road to Damascus. Acts chapter 9. In the first verse, the Bible says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughters 
uh, slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus and to the synagogues that he might, that if he found any of this way, meaning Christian, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near to Damascus, and suddenly there shined a, uh, round about him a light from heaven. Now that sounds very familiar, sounds very similar to what Isaiah experienced. Now we know that on this occasion, that Paul was actually saved. A little bit different because Isaiah was already a man of God. But the similarity is this. It changed his life and it made him useful in God. And, and if you know your Bible, whenever the one that baptized him, he said, he told him, he said, uh, you go, for he's a chosen vessel unto me. And I will show him what great things he must suffer for my name's sake. See, he was already preparing Paul. You think Paul was prepared for that the day the Lord saved him? No, it took time. It took prayer. It, it, took, it took investigation into the scriptures that they had at that time, which was the Old Testament. And um, it took experiences with Christ. Like the night that he met him and said, Fear not, Paul, for thou must speak unto me of Rome. Like the time he had to write down the letters to Timothy, he was worried about him. When he heard about Corinth being in such a bad shape, and he wrote to him and said, Boys, you better straighten it up. Yeah. When, he, when he wrote to Rome, and he says, I see you're defecting. Romans chapter 1 visualizes the Catholic Church specifically. He knew which direction they were going and warned them. Now I want you to see he was fit enough. He didn't say, oh well, you know, Rome is a hellish city anyway. Forget about it. He outlined their problems and he sent it with love. See, that's someone that's fit for the master's use. And, and, and I'm afraid sometimes that we have left that somehow and, and we forget what we're not doing. Now, me and Brother Eric have been working on a little bedroom there in our house. And uh, while working on it, I realized I'm not as fit as I used to be. And Eric and I was discussing. And I found we both came up with the same answer, although I don't know that it's the right answer. We both decided we were old. And, uh, but I've often wondered, is, was it that? Or was it because we not worked ourselves up? Last thing I did that kept me really spiritually fit, I mean, excuse me, physically fit, was when we built this building. You know, this building is now 14 years old. <laughs> That's a long time not to be physically fit, but much, much more dangerous to be spiritually unfit. Amen. Not given unto the things of God. Right. Uh, not ready. Be instant in season and out of season. And you know what? We get in our mind that the right season and the Bible has some indication of this, but we, we write ourselves off on it. Remember thy creator in the days of thy youth when the hard times come, it's not. And, uh, but see, he may want you to go now. 51 years old. If he said, Larry, you and Donna need to go to South America and take those three works on. Would we, both of us, or she said me 51, be willing to pick up everything that we've got, leave our grandchildren, our sons behind, and go. See, if you don't put yourself in that situation or a situation like it, you really can't know if you're spiritually fit or not, can you? Right. You say, oh, I'm in good shape. Good shape until he calls you to do something? See, that's the test, isn't it? I've often wondered about soldiers that are constantly 
preparing themselves. And you know, my brother served 20 years, and the closest he got to any combat was just off the shores of Iraq, and it was sending supplies to the troops. And he didn't even take the supply ships in. He was manning the big ship. But see, what if the president said, take the Navy boats and attack them from the coast? We've well, been ready. See, would, would he, and, and you know what, I have to say would be in because the Army and the Navy and the Marines are very stringent on their preparation. And that makes it so they can leave when they need to. Uh, they, they can move very quickly. So what about you? Are, you? are you lending yourself to the Lord? Are you ready? If he, said, if he said this morning, go to Mexico, would you go? If he said this morning, uh, testify of my goodness and my grace, are you ready? Well, what's your situation? And only you can answer it. Now, we're going to have a song in a minute, and then I know this business meeting afterwards, but for the moment, let's just center on where we're at. For the moment, let's just center in. Are you fit? Are you ready? Are you yielding yourself? And again, only you can answer that, Brother Junior.